Let's focus on the third party case then. In this particular case, I mean a relative. So for example, a relative comes to see you about their daughter or their father or their brother or their friend or something like that. So a third party case, how do you tackle these situations slightly differently to the, the ones that we've talked about so far? So one of the first things you wanna do in a third party scenario is understand the situation early on. So try and figure out some basics to get your head right about who's who and where are other people, etc. So for example, if the patient is not with them, you know, where is the patient right now? Are they at work? Are they at school? Um, you know, why, why are they not here with you right now? Is it because they don't know that you're here? Is it because they don't want to be here with you? Is it because they're too worried to come and see with you? Is it because they want you to ask questions more? There's many reasons why patients may be with you or not with you. But again, understanding this early on sets the bearings right. Do they even know that you're here? Like I said, there's a big difference between someone coming to see you because they're worried about someone and they haven't told them um, versus that the person is happy for them to be there to discuss it and they'd rather they do it than the person themselves. Again, understanding this early on can set your bearings, right? Have you spoken to them about discussing notes? Um, so this is obviously to do with confidentiality, which we'll talk about in a second, but getting that, that baseline right early on is important. Have you discussed with them about talking about their medical records? If they say, yes, doctor, I've discussed it. Have you got any proof? Have you got any letter? Have you got it written in the notes? Again, very important. We'll talk about confidentiality in a second. And what have you discussed with the patient so far? Maybe they haven't discussed anything with the patient so far. Maybe they discussed lots with the patient so far. Again, this comes into the ice bit, which we'll talk about in a second. But getting the situation understood early on when it comes to the core basics of a third party case is very important. It'll save you a lot of time as you go through the rest of that particular scenario. Then you've got your three components, data gathering, interpersonal and management. As always, let's focus on data gathering first. Remember in data gathering, in a third party scenario, you can ask as many questions as you like. There's no limit to the number of questions you can ask, regardless of whether there's confidentiality issues or not, or consent issues or not. You can ask as much as you like. Okay, there's that, that, that bit should be clear in your mind and you can still focus it around the three bubbles because the three bubbles are gonna give you issues, whether it's a third party case or not, you need to understand issues in the scenario to allow you to manage the situation in the second half. So the three bubbles are key. Red flags, when it comes to red flags in a third party case, think of it in two broad angles. You've got your clinical red flags, which are the ones that you're going to do based on what that person's worried about. If they're coming with, you know, worried about memory problems or they're worried about their brother who had a seizure or they're worried about their father who's got a change in bowel habit, of course, you will tailor your clinical red flags accordingly, but you need to ask all those questions just the same as if it was the person themselves coming to see you. And the other red flag that you must think about in a third party case is confidentiality. Now, confidentiality, of course, is a must until you're 100% okay and confident that you can give patient records. Remember, confidentiality is not about how many questions you ask to a relative. It's about the information that you give to a relative that's on the medical records. So confidentiality is about the medical records and giving information away, not asking questions to that relative. So even if you haven't got consent by the patient to talk to the relative. It doesn't mean that the consultation stops. You can still ask as many questions as you like and you can still manage those issues as well as you can. What you can't do is talk about information on the records. Now there's a couple things I wanna talk about in terms of confidentiality that I see a lot when people um, do recording and practice, etc. So like now, another thing to bear in mind in BBN, in Breaking Bad News, is that you will get questions that you can't answer, okay? They're going to be difficult questions that you don't have answer to right now that may keep coming. Things like, doctor, how long have I got left to live then? And is this curable? And how long, and, you know, am I gonna, have I got at least three months doctor? And am I gonna die doctor? You know, these kind of questions are inevitable when someone is given news like, this could be a cancer or this is a cancer, for example. So there's a couple of things that you can do to try and uh, prepare yourself for these difficult uh, questions. Because if you don't prepare yourself, then you're gonna find yourself struggling to figure out how to handle them. Three steps are very important when you get a question like this. Number one, you've got to acknowledge. Number two, you've got to be honest. Number three, you've got to keep the ball rolling. Acknowledge, be honest, keep the ball rolling. Let's start with acknowledge first. You've got to acknowledge where these questions are coming from. Mrs. Eklo, I can understand this information that we've just given you is going to cause a lot of questions in your mind. So acknowledge and empathize that these questions are normal. If you just stop at acknowledging it and don't take it any further, they'll keep asking the question. So doctor, what do you think? Am I gonna die? So the second step is be honest. You know, I'm, unfortunately, at present, I don't have answers to these particular questions. I don't have an answer to that particular question, unfortunately. Be clear that you don't have an answer to that question. If you leave it at step two, 
they'll keep pushing you. But what do you think, doctor? What's your gut feeling? What's your reaction? So you need to move on to step three, keep the ball rolling, keep the ball rolling. Let's see what we can do to get closer to those answers for you. So number one, acknowledge it. I can see where this is coming from. Number two, be honest. I really don't have the answer right now. But number three, flip it into something that's positive. Let's talk about the couple of things that we can do now to get closer to those answers. Because if you stop at any one of those first two steps, then the question will keep on coming. It's our job to flip it into something, into a different conversation that takes it a little bit further. So this needs a bit of practice worth doing a few times, but these three steps can really help in managing and, and handling these difficult questions. And remember, if we get, we'll go through some of these differentials in a second, but knowing that there are various causes in the back of your mind will determine how you go through your focus history. So some early things are important just to get out the way to get your bearings right. So what's the gestation of the pregnancy? Is the pain sudden onset or gradual onset? What's the duration? Has it got any particular character like colicness, for example? Is it constant? What's the site and what's the radiation of the pain? Is it on one side of the abdomen? Is it central? Is it radiating to the back, etc.? A lot of these are going to coincide with the abdominal pain case that we did in the GI section, but there are some tweaks, of course, due to the nature of the person being pregnant. And then management is still issues-based. You will still focus your management around the issues that you work out in the first half, but you really want to focus everything on the one thing that hopefully you've picked up in the first half that matter to them. Every issue that you're going to discuss in the second half about their condition or life or whatever you want to talk about has got to revolve around the one thing that matters to them. Otherwise, you will struggle with a blase patient case. So for example, Mr. X, look, I know that you mentioned that you were really worried about dialysis and that's a big worry to have. Why don't we see what we can do to try and prevent that from happening? Miss X, look, let's try and look at your weight or your exercise or your medication to try and reduce the chances of having dialysis. I know that was really on your mind. So let's see what we can do to try and reduce those chances. Mr. X, look, you mentioned that you were worried about dialysis. Look, if we don't tackle your kidney function now and the fact that it's dropping rapidly, we may end up going down that dialysis route. So let's see what we can do to try and reduce that from happening. Now, Mr. X, look, you mentioned that you had a hectic job, a busy job that you really love let's try and reduce the chances of this being impacted by dialysis in the future by taking a few steps from today. Have you noticed how the one thing that this person might have told me in the first half was that they were worried about dialysis. They're not worried about the fact that their GFR is dropping. They're not worried about the fact that their renal function is going down. They're not worried about the condition that may be causing that, but they're worried about dialysis. So every point I have in the second half needs to focus on dialysis. Otherwise, my management plan is going to be a very one-sided affair because the other person is not really engaged in the outcome of what we're trying to achieve together. And that's where a blase patient can get very challenging. And that's where it's so important to understand that one thing from your data gathering in the first half. Remember, you differentials, like we said right at the beginning, not all psychosis is psychiatric. Yes, psychiatric um, makes up a bulk of reasons as to why someone presents in this way. And within psychiatry, there are many different causes, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, for example. But remember the organic causes, temporal lobe epilepsy, sepsis, delirium, drug-induced psychosis. Don't miss these out if you get a presentation like this. Now, if you get a presentation of a first psychotic episode, that's obviously very different to managing a person who's got a known schizophrenia, for example, that you're doing as a follow-up. But if it's a first psychotic episode, initially you're going to be thinking about, do I need to rule out organic causes here? So at some point, they're going to need investigations, blood tests, for example, maybe a CT head, if there's any doubt of a organic causes. It comes down to ultimately, like we said, risk to self or risk to others. If you think there's high risk to self, whether it's suicidal risk, risky behavior, or whether you think there are risks to others, for example, they're getting um, voices telling them to go and harm somebody, then that's when you've got to think about same day assessment, whether it's on-call psychiatry team, on-call crisis team, but they need to be assessed on that day. If they're not high risk to self or not high risk to others, and you've got to be really clear on the fact that you've got justification as to why you believe they're not high risk, and you think there's no physical underlying cause and you're pretty sure it's a psychiatric cause behind this, then you may think an urgent psychiatry review, whether it's in the next day, the next 48 hours, the next week, may be appropriate, but you really have to be confident that there's no risk to self or risk to others. And if there's any doubt, it has to be same day assessment when it comes to first psychotic episode. Now, of course, if you're managing a different type of case where somebody's got known schizophrenia, for example, then of course you may be talking about different medications that they're taking. You may be talking about um, 
you know, group therapies or community-based therapies or CBT, for example, and all that plan may be discussed along with the issues in a slightly different way. But if you get a first psychotic episode, then this is the approach that you should be taking in a case that you may get. Can they, can they wait an hour? Can they go home first and pick something up? How are they going to get into hospital? Like, are they going to go on their own? Are they safe to drive? If not, who can take them? If no one can take them, do they need an ambulance or can they get a taxi? Like all these are logistics. So again, a lot of this is based on psychosocial, like knowing who's around and do they drive, etc. early on so that you can talk about these in the second half. Do you need to call somebody? You know, this person is about to go into hospital. You know, you may want to put a line there, like you mentioned your wife earlier on, like, do, do you want us to give her a quick call, explain what's going on? No, no, doctor, I'm okay, I can do it. Or doctor, actually, that'd be really helpful. But just, you know, offering these things interpersonally is great because it shows that, yes, my clinical thing is to get them into hospital and that's my priority, but there is so much around this situation that is going to be affected and therefore can I help in any other way? So logistics are really important. Are they safe to dive? Like I mentioned, these things are so important and they allow you to potentially score more because you're thinking more than just, I've got to get them to hospital and that's it. And that's what most people do. And therefore they may do the right thing, but they may not score as much as they potentially could do. Make sure there's a bit of time to discuss what might happen in hospital. And no time put offer here, okay? Not everybody wants to know what's going to happen in the hospital. So your job is not to say, when you get to hospital, this is what's going to happen, this test will happen, this treatment will happen, this this specialist will see you. It's to offer that. You know, Mr. X, obviously you, you've had to take a lot in and, and you weren't expecting to go to the hospital. And, you know, apologies that it got to this point. Do you want me to quickly run through what might happen when you get there? Oh, doctor, yeah, please, just, uh, I don't like any surprises. So please, what's going to happen? Or, doctor, you know what, right now, I, I, I just need to take this all in and, um, I just want to get there and, and, and think about it. I don't, I don't want to know any more at this point. Both are fine, but you offer to discuss what may happen. It's not just you go and bombard them with all this stuff because you think that you're going to get marks for it. And of course, there were certain questions that may well come in admission cases. So, um, you know, things that you may not have all the answers to, but things that you almost need to anticipate will come your way. So, doctor, am I going to need to stay in overnight? You know, doctor, why can't I just go in tomorrow? Doctor, what about my work? Doctor's going to look after my cat. Who's going to collect my children, for example? These are all things that you may have anticipated based on some of the things that they said in the first half. Some of these things you don't have answers to. So sometimes you have to be honest. Mrs. X, look, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen in terms of staying overnight because that may depend on tests and investigations that happen in hospital. But, you know, whatever happens, at least you going in, you're doing the right thing now. And then we can see what happens later on. And, and if you need some support and call me and get some answers, we can always talk about that later on Don't for in the UK. But it's important to check early on what the contraception is actually needed for. It's not always to prevent pregnancy. Of course, lots of um, medications that are used um, to help things like acne or to help things like period uh, disturbances can also come into the contraception bracket. So important to understand why the person wants contraception and not assume straight away is to prevent pregnancy. In general, when you do a women's health scenario, there's a key triad to think about when you talk about one, make sure you think or talk about the other two as well. So if someone comes in for, to talk about contraception, for example, then you want to be thinking in the back of your mind two things. STI, so have we, do you have a, t a discussion about sexually transmitted infections? Could there be a risk of an STI, for example? Is that another angle to think about? And then checking the person's not pregnant right now. So they may come in to talk about the combined oral contraceptive pill, for example, but if you miss the fact that they may already be pregnant, then again, that would change the case almost a red flag. So similarly, when someone comes to talk about a sexually transmitted infection or risk of STI, think about talking about contraception, think about checking they're not pregnant right now. And if someone comes and says, doctor, I think I'm pregnant, have a discussion about contraception, whether they've been on it in the past, or have they stopped now that they're pregnant, and think about risk of STI alongside it. So that triad always goes together when you think about women's health scenarios in general. Miss X, there are several different types to prevent pregnancy. Could I go through a couple of questions which may help me to work out which one may suit your needs in particular? So going through a detailed history to work out eligibility and suitability for all the different types. And we'll cover the different types that you may talk about in a second. So understanding yourself, which different types can I consider for this person before I have a discussion in the management plan? So how do you do that? Go through a thorough period history, and we'll cover that in a, a different case later on in this chapter, how to do a thorough period history, carry out a thorough. One of the important things in data gathering, because when there's an angry patient, as you guys will know when you, you know, you've practiced this, you're trying to ask questions, you're trying to gather data, but the person's so angry that you're getting very little space to do so. So one thing you've got to constantly be thinking about in an angry patient scenario is the importance to buy some shallow time. If you if you keep buying yourself little pockets of shallow time, 
In those little pockets, you can start to ask some questions. But if you're not buying yourself shallow time, you're going to find it very hard to get through that anger to get the information that you want and therefore manage the case successfully. So there's a couple of things that you can do to try and buy shallow time and a variety of these, a combination of these might help throughout data gathering. This is really important, regular reflection or acknowledgement of the anger and frustration. If you don't regularly reflect the fact that I can see this is really frustrating, I can see this is really annoying you, I can see you've been through a really tough time, I can see it, I can see it, I can see it. If you're not doing that regularly, then this person who's angry is thinking, look, the person doesn't even get that I'm angry. There's no reflection, but they don't get it. Let's get angrier. So before you know, they go up and up and up and up and they get to too, in a too high a point where you just can't get them down anymore. So every 20, 30, 40 seconds, gosh, I can see this has been, must have been tough. Gosh, I can see this is frustrating. Swap chairs like we talk about. I said this many times already in the course so far. Look, if I was in this situation, I'd feel just as frustrated. If this was me going through this right now, I'd feel just as annoyed. Again, the moment you swap chairs, you get that connection because you can see that people are seeing it from the same viewpoint as them. And you're not saying, I understand that you're frustrating because that's saying that I'm, I'm trying to understand your mind. If this was me, I'd feel the same. Very powerful thing to use, particularly when someone's angry. And acknowledge their importance. You know, one thing that an angry person would want is some acknowledgement that they have the ability to do things like so you're right this is a really important issue i'm with you you know absolutely this is something that does need looking into so you're kind of agreeing with what they're saying you're acknowledging their importance that's very important because that will buy you little pockets of shallow time to allow you to do things like your bubbles your red flags your psychosocial your ice which you might find very difficult if you don't do these types of things so buy shallow time regular reflection or acknowledgement swap chairs and acknowledge their importance on a regular basis. Now, at some point, you're going to have to do some data gathering. So red flags are very important. Sometimes you might have a list of 15 red flags and this person's already angry. So you're struggling to get them all in. Again, clear reasoning, clear signposting is really, really important. Mr. X, look, I know there's lots going on right now. I know you're frustrated. But for me to try and see how I can help you best, there are a couple of yes, no kind of medical questions that I need to ask about your pain or about your you know, condition or whatever it is, just to see how we can help you best. Again, clear signpost and then get those questions in. Don't just try and squeeze them in here, there and everywhere because you'll forget the odd red flag. That could change the whole um, case completely. Don't show your cards too early. Sometimes, say for example, someone's coming very angry saying, um, I don't know, I want, I want you to write a letter to this doctor or I want a, um, an urgent CT scan today, for example. Sometimes because of the pressure of the anger, we give an answer too early. Like, yes, of course we can do that. And then later on you have to go, well, actually we, we, we can't do that. And that of course is not gonna go down well. Or people just kind of get forced saying, look, actually, no, I don't think I can do a letter or I don't think you need a CT scan too early. And then you can't do that because you get them much more angry at this point. So just don't show your card too early. But the way you do that is just by regularly acknowledging, yeah, of course we can talk about the letter. Of course, I promise we can talk about that scan. Um, but just a couple more questions to see if it's the best thing for you. Again, you just, you're, you're just acknowledging things regularly to buy yourself shallow time to allow you to have a better conversation in the second half. But don't show your cards too early. Let's move on to a cough or presentation of a cough. We'll be covering cough in more detail in some of the conditions that we'll be talking about, asthma, COPD, later on in the chapter. But what if someone just presents with a cough? You've got to find a way, of course, to go through a focus history because there are obviously multiple causes that you need to be thinking about when it comes to differential. So going through the onset of the cough, when did it start? How long has it been there for? How often is it coming? Does it have a pattern, for example, diurnal variation where it's worse in the morning and worse at night? Thinking about asthma, for example, anything that makes it better or worse. So things like cold, for example, dusty environments, does that trigger off the cough or make it worse or anything that makes it better? Um, you know, the, the, the middle of the day time, for example, certain treatments they might have tried. What is the type of cough? Try and get them to describe it. Of course, if they're coughing right now, it's helpful to try and assess that yourself. But if they're, if they're not, then can they describe it? Is it a dry cough? Is it productive? Does it sound like a barking cough, of course? And what associations like sputum, for example, these kind of things are very important to pick up um, in a systemized way. Looking at symptoms and signs of other particular systems, so going through them one by one, so ENT system, for example, so do they have features of an upper respiratory tract infection, like a, a sore throat, runny nose, for example, any hearing impairment, uh, like we mentioned, things that all can link to the ENT system. Chest symptoms, so dyspnea, wheeze, chest pain, so going through just alongside the cough, what else could be going on from a respiratory point of view? Cardiac symptoms, so proximal nocturnal dyspnea, orthopnea, thinking about heart failure, of course, uh, palpitations, edema. GI symptoms, could this cough be all due to reflux or heartburn, for example, or water brush, so asking about those kind of acid feelings in the throat or you know indigestion type symptoms, for example. 
going back in history, so past medical history, uh, whether you have it or not, looking to see is there anything that may be linked towards this current cough, so a history of reflux, a history of heart failure, any particular allergies that you may be aware of in the past medical history. What about the family history, so things like asthma, lung cancer, of course. Drug history, so ACE inhibitors is one that might stand out that might have recently started ACE inhibitors for some cardiovascular problem and it have come with this cough, for example. Any background of allergies, things like pollen and hay fever, again, could be linked to things like asthma, but also in, in themselves can lead to cough as well. So worth going through things in a systematic way to try and start to differentiate some of the, the numerous causes, which we'll talk about um, in a second. Of course, like with any presentation, there are certain things that you need to be ruling out pretty early on in the presentation that would change your plan very quickly. So when you're looking at things in terms of an assessment point of view, are they systemically unwell? Do they have a fever, a vomiting, acute dyspnea, chest pains? We'll talk about acute shortness of breath um, in another part of this particular chapter. Suspected malignancy, so are they you know, background smoker, hemoptysis, hoarse voice, weight loss, dysphagia, the things that hopefully straight away would change your perception of the presentation of this particular cough. Any chronic respiratory disease that I've had that may have changed significantly recently. So do they have a background of COPD that's getting worse? Are they bringing up more sputum now if they've got a background of bronchiectasis, for example? So bearing in mind previous history that's getting worse rapidly. And then, of course, suspected heart failure would go down almost as a red flag because of the need to do assessments and management fairly quickly, particularly if their symptoms um, are quite severe. So do they have things like PND, peripheral edema, uh, like we talked about in the history part of it. Psychosocially, lots of the link when it comes to coughs, of course, looking at smoking history, that's the one that stands out, particularly if they're a smoker age over 45 and they've started to cough uh, recently. Any background of recreational drugs that might be linked to causing them to have a cough as well. Going through their occupational history, do they have a history of asbestos exposure, for example, very important to pick up in the story. Has this cough impacted them at work? Maybe, for example, they're in an office with only three or four people and they're coughing quite regularly and it's causing Problems amongst the other people, either getting, you know, colleagues are getting frustrated or they're worried about infections being passed on, for example. So again, impact at work can be a real thing and the trigger maybe that they came to see you. Now, let's go into a little bit of detail on the data gathering first then, and let's look at the clinical side of this. Mostly people are very good at doing clinical consultations, of course, but remember on a telephone case, there is no question that is too much, okay? You're starting with a blank sheet of paper. You can't see anybody. There's no visuals at all. You can't see if they're in pain. You can't see if they're lying down. You can't see if they're having breathing difficulty. So you've got to start with a blank sheet of paper and ask pretty much every question that you can to try and draw that image in your mind of the person in front of you. Okay, so no question is too much. In real life, in face-to-face in -face consultations, you see somebody, it cuts out the need to ask a lot of questions because it's pretty obvious what you're seeing. Whereas on a telephone consultation, you can't do that. So you can't assume any clinical question on telephone case. So set it up really well. This is X, um, you know, when it comes to uh, coughing, there's a, quite a few yes, no questions that we like to ask just to make sure we can see that everything is okay. I'm just gonna run through a few if that's okay. So set it up, give the reasoning, and then ask lots and lots of clinical questions until you're happy that you've formed a decent picture in your mind that you can then take further going forward. So remember, no clinical question is too much. Um, there's no point taking shortcuts here. You've got to understand the situation inside out. Then, of course, you do your psychosocial bubble and you do your ice. That's similar to how you do it in a standard case. But then it comes on to the examination part. Now, of course, in an examination, in a telephone case, it's very difficult. You can't physically do anything. But it's still important to vocalize what you plan to do so that an assessor can understand where your mind is going. So, for example, what I see a lot of people doing is, Mrs. X, actually, you know, thank you for all those questions. Um, we need to do an examination, actually. So maybe we should get you into the surgery or into the, the clinic. Um, to take this further. But there's no real understanding of what are you going to do and why are you choosing to do the examination in the first place because of the rationale of doing it. So get used to trying to explain this verbally. So Mrs. X, thank you so much for answering all those questions. I know um, I asked a lot of you just now. I'd like to at some point actually do an examination and the, and the kind of things that I'd be thinking of doing are checking things like your temperature and checking your blood pressure, having a listen to your heart sounds, having a listen to your chest and maybe having a feel of your tummy as well. So at the end of this consultation, maybe we should try and set up an appropriate time for us to be able to do that. Now you see straight away, I've not just said I'd like to examine you, I've, I've demonstrated why I want to examine somebody 
And what are the core things that I'm expecting to do when that person comes in later on? Because remember, you're still trying to demonstrate your thinking process. And if you're doing this in a non-assessment situation, you might just say, I'd like to examine you. And then they come in later and you examine them because you know in your mind what you're doing. But you've got to be able to demonstrate your thinking and demonstrate and justify the reason for them to come in. So make sure you practice this because it's just not something that automatically will come out when you're doing lots and lots of telephone consultations. Then the bit that people often struggle with and, and worry about when it comes to telephone cases is management because they find that managements are very short because in a lot of situations, you're basically just saying, well, actually, look, we need to get you in because um, I need to be able to examine you. And then depending on that, we need to do this. And then depending on that, we need to do this. And we don't really know where we're going. So the management actual part of the consultation is very short. But if you start to think about what we talked about earlier on in the course, managing the situation and trying to think about, can I utilize some of the information that I brought out in the first half and bring that into the second half, even though I may not know a diagnosis yet, even though I may not know exactly what's going on yet, I can still talk about how I can take this story forward. So you've got to manage the situation not the condition or the symptom. That's really important. Lots to think about from an examination point of view. You're trying to think about sources and underlying causes, of course, but general observations initially are going to be important. Temperature, blood pressure, JVP, heart rate, respiratory rate, oxygen saturations. There are a few more that you may do as well. You may be looking to diagnose delirium formally. So CAM criteria, DSM-5 criteria, the four A's test, for example. You may be thinking more in terms of a memory assessment at some point as well. So GP COG, for example, we'll talk about dementia in a bit more detail later on in this chapter. Mental state examination to identify symptoms of things like depression or anxiety, which could also be important in terms of your overall management. And of course, a general physical examination to try and work out, is there any source that I can identify and treat that may be um, an initial sign of where the confusion or delirium is coming from. So an abdominal examination, respiratory examination, cardiovascular examination, um, an MSK, musculoskeletal, neurological examination, look in the back of the eyes, lots of things that you might do from a physical point of view. Maybe you'll dip the urine to check there's no obvious urinary tract infection. Maybe you'll check a blood glucose to look for things like hypoglycemia or the other extreme of things like DKA, for example, and also things like an ECG to check for things like arrhythmias that may be important in terms of underlying cause. So um, lots of things to think about in examination. It's going to vary a little bit based on the story that you have, but in general, when it's confusion, delirium, query cause, there's quite a bit they need to think about from an examination point of view. And the reason behind that is, of course, is because of the wide list of possible differentials that you may think about. Now, you're not going to be thinking about every single one of these in a situation that presents in front of you, but hopefully your um, focus history and your examination would have kind of put three or four at the top of your list in terms of uh, possible differentials. Could it be an infective picture? UTI, of course, very common cause of confusion, particularly in elderly patients, pneumonia, meningitis, encephalitis, but any infection in essence can lead to this kind of presentation. Could it be a metabolic cause? So B12 deficiency, hyponatremia, uremia, hypoxia, thyroid disease. Could it be drug-induced delirium, drug-induced confusion? So alcohol, opioids, recreational drugs. Other physical causes, so things like a space-occupying lesion, for example, carcinomatosis. Could it be a post-ictal phase? Could it be dementia, but a rapid changing of uh, features? And could it be a psychiatric underlying cause, depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, that present in this manner? Um, so again, important to think about both physical, but also mental health point of view in terms of possible differentials. Management is going to vary significantly on what you think the underlying causes may be. But if you're seeing somebody in the community, of course, admission to hospital pretty urgently is going to be important as an initial first step. Start with ABC, start with supportive measures, try and stabilize somebody if you're seeing them for the first time. Acute management of any conditions or underlying causes, so correct things that can be corrected um, and manage things that you can manage at this particular stage. Remove any precipitating medications that may be adding to the problem or causing it in the first place. As time goes on, there's a need for a regular risk assessment just to make sure that things are getting better, but also things are not starting to develop again if there's a history of this developing regularly. Conservative measures, so things like think about safety in the room. Is there any need to, to add things into the room or the environment to reduce risk um, associated with confusion? Things like orientation aids and so making sure there's a clock on the wall so people have that regular focal point to know what time of day it is or what date it is, for example. Family visits, regular communication, again, need to be discussing support systems, who's involved in the story and who else might benefit the patient by having um, input into their management. 
And in certain situations, if you think about medications, you can, according to the guidance, consider low-dose haloperidol on a short-term basis. But of course, you'll be weighing risks and benefits and you'll be treating that as a case-by-case approach. It's not a general thing that you may think about. So management for delirium or confusion is going to vary significantly depending on where you're joining that particular story. But again, it can be quite a a high-packed consultation because there's lots to think about from a um, safety point of view, um, stabilization point of view, underlying cause point of view, finalized by management as well. And often there's a third party input as well. So it can be quite challenging, but lots of opportunity to demonstrate um, a lot of good skill, but also working confidently under high pressure.